going with this live uh, things. Give us a sec. You're good. Good. All right. Sorry about that. So take two. Um, welcome. It's our first live design session uh, from MakerBot. I am Felipe. Uh, I've been working with MakerBot for a while. And uh, today I want to talk to you about a project that I recently did, uh, basically a bicycle seat. Uh, I like bikes a lot. I race a lot myself. And I took it upon myself to design, you know, do a quick sprint, design sprint on, a, on, the, on the bicycle seat. You know, how would I improve it? What ideas I wanted to test out? And just kind of running through the process of designing a specific object. So that's what we will be discussing today. Uh, also today, uh, Alison joins us behind the camera. She'll be taking all of your comments and uh, questions over. So feel free to comment uh, live in the, in the feed. Uh, let us know if you have any specific questions, if you want me to go slower or faster. Um, and yeah, we will be sending you guys also a couple of SEL files that you can print maybe later on from with the results of what we did. But uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us and uh, let's get started. So basically I started with um, the bicycle saddle, as I said before. Um, I wanted to recreate something that, um, you know, represented me in a way. I wanted to create something more personalized. I also wanted to understand what were some of the constraints or uh, components of the saddle. Because if you think about it, it's a fairly simple object, right? It's basically just a seat for you while you're on the bike. But already when we look at a, a standard one, which is, uh, well, this is the one that I got on my bike, um, you have a few components. You have the different ergonomic uh, measurements for you to feel comfortable with the saddle. You also have a core out that acts as a good way to bend and a, a good way to diminish the weight of the saddle, which is really important if you're racing. And you have on the other side kind of like the, the actual attachment to the bike, right? So these two rods, these two metallic rods, uh, that um, these two metallic rods that are actually tying the saddle to the bike. Um, so I started you know, just like thinking about what I wanted to do with it and also trying to understand the general idea of the, uh, of the object itself, right? So I'll start just, you know, sketching a little bit, generally speaking, just I think it's one of the fastest ways to get the idea out, just to get your mind started. You do have the object as reference, but just to get a feel for the geometry that you're trying to create. So. One of the easiest views here, um, and do let me know if you guys can actually see the contrast in the wall lines. I'm hoping that you will. Uh, but one of the one of the easiest views of the saddle itself would be just to start kind of with um, the side view, right? Uh, so in the side view, I could imagine doing some a little bit of um, um, some surfacing elements, right? Uh, maybe that crest, that little crest that comes up and then down, tapers down. Um, maybe highlighting the transition between those surfaces. And all that I'm doing right now um, is trying to get a feel for the geometry that I'll be creating or recreating later on on CAD, right? So let's take these. Um, I'll just highlight the silhouette a bit. Um, oh, and maybe what we mentioned before, right? So the core out over here to diminish the weight from the side view. Also, um, another view that I could be working on, which is uh, super critical in this case because of the, of, the, of the geometry itself, would be the top view. So I start just translating my, my reference points, basically the size of the geometry that I'm creating. Um, and then, well, looking at where my thickest points will be, kind of just you know, reference lines that will help me get that contour. Well, oh. I also here, just as a guide, I think it's also really useful to get the, the half line of the object because it, it gives you a better frame of work, right, when you're when you're at, when you're um, iterating and, and creating the sketch. So, okay, um, kind of that transition. It's not entirely mirrored, and in this case, just because it's a you know kind of a, a really abstract sketch, it's just me trying to think about uh, what I want to do. So also highlighting that core out section. These part right here goes you know kind of like that that surface change so I'm assuming that it'll have some sort of padding area right here right at some point I could also be taking just one of the components and think well what about if I looked at the at the bike seat from the back or from behind what about just adding so this is kind of uh, a general view of the, of the, of the rear of the saddle right so if I, if I show you guys that section it's like those curves, um, so just the back section of the curve, maybe, you know, as, as we all know, or, or if you guys ride bikes, uh, kind of 
adding the light on, on, on the saddle itself. That'd be an interesting concept. So already I am trying to figure out kind of the ideas that I will, I will want to pursue, right? So maybe making it a little bit thicker or bumpier for me to feel more comfortable. Maybe adding an, an additional element like the light uh, so that I can you know, not have to wear a secondary light when I'm doing that. And then once I get an understanding for, for the shape itself, this is going to be, um, I would say, fairly abstract. Right? This is going to be um, flat, naturally, because it's a sketch. So I'll want to jump into CAD to make sure that I'm actually understanding all of the views that make up this object. So I, I'll start by, again, uh, go, going back to my reference object, so looking at the saddle itself, and you know, taking my caliper, doing a couple of measurements, um, uh, a, couple of me a couple of measurements, on different points of it. So the thick, the thickness over here, the thickness in the widest points, the thickness on the endpoints. And I'll now jump to my screen. Um, if you guys want to follow along, I am using, and this is kind of my software of choice, uh, Rhino. Uh, I really like it, but hopefully in the next, next lessons, we'll be talking about other software. In this case, I'm going to be focusing on Rhino. Let me, guys, let me know if you guys have any questions specifically to that. Um, but here you can see how I basically took the general dimensions and started measuring that out. This geometry I already had, so I had, I had a way of actually cheating a little bit. I was just trying to make sure that I had an object to reference to, kind of making sure that I had the right points. So you can see over here, I am getting the, the, the widest points. I'm getting that neck of the, of the seat itself and the, the thinnest points as well. And once I get that started, let me take you guys over here to kind of my my second item. Um, here we go, jumping to perspective and hiding that. So once once I have that, I'll start again. This is where I start. I start going back to what I did before in the sketches. I'll start just taking those guide curves as reference, right? So I'll start thinking about the main curve that I had. Describing that side view, I'll start taking the, the middle section that sort of describes that center center point that the saddle is uh, or center line that runs through the saddle and the end point. And there's a, a really nice tool, uh, just um, cur oh, sorry, sorry, surface from network, network surface, there we go. So I can select each of those curves, so the side curve, middle curve, last curve, and then the sections that go in the opposite direction, right? So in the, in the opposite set of planes. So the last one, kind of a section in the middle, a section in the, uh, in the neck, and then a couple of sections that I had drawn out in the front side of it. You can preview, and I see that it's actually matching my design nicely, right? Matching kind of my general idea nicely. One thing to remember is that, again, going back to what, what I was doing here in the sketch, um, these curves that I, I'm trying to sort of translate from one view to the other are going to help me better design those curves in the in the in the model itself right so when I when I think about the section over here if I was to take just that section and kind of project it here I would know that that section is going to be wider right um, and then as I move forward in that in that object the section gets narrower right so we, we get that kind of like if you think of, a, of a, an MRI scan, trying to get all of those layers so that I can get an idea of what or how to tell the computer how to represent or better represent that, that uh, object. So moving back to CAD, um, what happens if I don't have enough, um, what happens if I don't have enough uh, curves then is, let me just run this example again. Let's say I just do the side sections, the front, uh, sorry, the back and the front section. If I run that again, and I let you guys see the preview, you see how now the, the computer doesn't really know um, how to follow along, and it's just taking a best guess, best guess approach. So here in the center part, instead of giving me a nice arch that actually will support uh, the body of the rider, it's, it's going almost uh, completely flat, right? Um, so it's, it's not quite doing what I'm expecting it to do. Whenever that happens, it's just because the computer is not getting enough, or the software itself, it's not getting enough information from me, right? It doesn't really understand what I'm, what I'm doing, because ultimately what we're doing here is establishing a dialogue with the computer. So um, 
you know, once I get that, um, I'll jump to kind of this first example, right? So this is this was my first geometry. There's nothing much to it. There's, it's kind of a, a very plain surface um, that I can that I can just get a feel for. But it's an important one because, and that's that's the kind of the first one that I printed out. So here's my first um, printout. Um, then the reason why this surface is going to be important for me is because even though it's just a plain one, it gives me enough information to start thinking about what I want to do next and how to project the more nuanced features on that object, right? So I can start thinking about, well, you know what? I actually want um, this surface to run a little bit faster. So I want to have a transition here kind of to add that thickness uh, and beefiness to the saddle. I've been talking about how to reduce the weight. So, you know, that's going to demand a way of, uh, I'll try to sketch on the, on the part um, right here. Hopefully you guys can, can see that. Uh, so kind of that same ellipse that I get on the, um, on this, on the seat itself for the core app. And I'll start sketching into the 3D part, which is, I personally, I find it great because on my trying to sketch um, in, the, in the sketchbook, in the, in the drawing board, the difference here is that I'm already projecting features into a 3D object, which is going to be really helpful when I try to jump back into CAD and, again, re-explain my process in a way to the computer. I, know, I don't know if that uh, makes any sense. But, um, and the other thing to note is that, you know, I feel like having access to a quick sketch version of the print um, it's going to also allow me to be not wary and not worried about, as I just did, right, sketching on the part itself. I want these parts that I print out to not be precious. So I want to be able to just be able to, you know, I have an idea, I print it, and then I'm able to sketch on top of it. I, I'm able to kind of trash it around and uh, play with it as much as I can, maybe even starting to get a feel for how strong it's going to be, having a feel for how stiff the curves are going to make it, or even playing with the ergonomics of it, right? So actually sitting on top of this, and it sounds kind of a, a very uh, silly exercise to, to begin with, but it gives you enough of an idea of how the surface is, is performing. And also, you know, of course, you can always go back to the original object. So I'm already testing my idea against a 3D object, and I'm having my idea represented in a 3D way, which is kind of the whole purpose of, of, of um, this first lesson, right? So understanding why is it important to 3D print something, aside from saying, hey, you can 3D print anything, and you can, um, you know, most people will, will defer to, say, to thinking that the printing part comes at the very end stage of the design process. But I think that it's important to be able to do it throughout and in a very kind of cheap, inexpensive way, because this this part itself, although I know it's not going to be the end result, it's going to help me think about what I'm trying to do. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump back again into CAD, and um, you'll, you'll start seeing here how, you know, from that simple surface, I started thinking it out. I won't get into too much detail into that because it's going to take us a while. I, I don't want to, to bore you guys a lot. But you can st start thinking how or seeing how I started just, you know, expanding those two surfaces. If I explode this into its components, right? I can show you guys how I was kind of just taking that surface, offsetting uh, offsetting it, and then connecting it by this these new surfaces that I generated, kind of giving me that, that nice fillet that made it less aggressive. Um, so in, in this case, you know, maybe, maybe instead of a, a proper, sorry, a chamfer, instead of a chamfer, I could have made a fillet so that it was a little bit smoother on the rider. But again, it's part of the, of the design process. So, Going back to here, and here's another thing that I wanted to show you guys. One of the cool things about Rhino is that it actually allows me to have all of my iterations on a single sort of work surface, right? So you'll start seeing here how I started by having very broad strokes, very uh, flat lines uh, that sort of describe the, the general geometry. And as I started moving forward, so you guys saw how you know we added those dimensions then started surfacing, simple surfacing, isolating some of those surfaces so that I can better understand uh, how those surfaces behave, what are the curves that are describing that surface. And then, you know, the next step over here is actually to start playing a little bit more with the features of the object, right? So I'll, 
I want to start and I'll jump to perspective because I think it's going to give us a little bit more a better view. So I started just looking at, okay, how do I provide the first main feature of the object? We talked about having um, coring out that's uh, coring out the, 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 the saddle itself. But what about just you know adding a little a little bit of a notch here in the back where I know that my backbone is not necessarily going to be hitting the saddle, so I could be eating out some material to make it lighter. What happens if I have instead of this continuous surface running through the whole the whole object, I have a little bit of a change in surface, right? So I saw that also happening in the in the original um, object, right? You, you you guys see how it sort of goes into this. Um, carved out area that that will give me some ventilation hopefully <laughs> it can get really hot when, when you're writing uh, but again so I'm I am adding those features slowly here and testing on, on trying them out and each of them each time that I, I get a new rev it's really important for me to be able to to kind of stop and say okay what about checking one of these so what about taking this guy right here I, I, I just call it kind of the horns version because of the yeah it looks kind of um, weird like that. So I took that one and I printed it out again, right? And, and it's it's funny how that happens where I will be working on CAD um, during the day. And then by the time I'm, I'm done, so I, I, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, I'll be able to just turn around. Sorry, sorry. I'm, uh, <laughs> let me know if the prints are too low, too high, but turn around and just hit print, right? Which is it's kind of a, a really big thing, and I'm, I'm, I know that I'm um, I'm really lucky like that. So having a makeup around it's it's amazing, and, and working over here it's amazing. Just having a direct access to the printer is great because I'll be able to, to kind of have the idea, sketch it during the day, and then have the printer work for me overnight while I rest. Right, so I'll be able to just uh, walk out of the building with uh, well knowing that I, I started the print, and then coming back the next morning. And instead of starting back in the in the CAD stage, right, where I was just designing the object, adding the features to it, I'll be able to just go out and, and test uh, the actual object. So the actual part and having it in my hands and saying, well, you know what, actually, this part again. And um, oh, another thing that I started playing with is you can see how the I started adding those um, the, the rods that in the case of the of the saddle itself were metal, but I started playing with just uh, putting them on uh, on, the pr on the printed part, um, so you know I can I can actually get a feel for this section. It's a little bit, it's it's too long of a section. It's it's too deep of a section. So maybe I'll, I'll want to reduce that. And I, I I don't really get a complete understanding just by looking at it in CAD. You know I, I know that many of you guys might be trained uh, professionals. I am I I'm an industrial designer myself. But it's it's somewhere there's always something missing in the cat part, right? There's so something that you sort of assume that it's going to be yeah, it's about two inches, should be about right. But getting it out and actually getting a feel for it is like I thought it was I thought I was right, but now I realize that it's a little bit too much, right? I, I can even try it on myself and say it's a little bit too aggressive of a feature. So how do I how do I reduce that? So just even taking notes for myself. How do I maybe change this little uh, feature here? So the chamfer, you can see how I move. I, I went away from what the the really aggressive chamfer that I had um, in CAD into a much more smaller and thinner one that actually is not as aggressive, but also looks uh, kind of interesting. Oh, you guys have a question? Yeah. Um, somebody asked. Edmund asked, uh, "How are stress tolerances determined when designing something like this?" Stress tolerances. I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you mean like on the object itself and how it's going to perform? How you take them into account, yeah, for like performance of something like this. Okay, so at this point, to be honest, it's it's I'm focusing more on the shape and the performance of that shape than the performance of the object. As I move forward, I will start the you know I, I will want to demand a little bit more of the print. I I will want to demand. Uh, you know, a proper flex uh, study, a proper um, rigidity study where I will need different durometers or to test out different durometers so that I can make sure that I'm getting the right rigidity. But at this point, I'm not so concerned about that. I'm just trying to capture the general idea of the shape before I demand of the object an actual performance. The reason why I do that is because it's going to be easier for me to be a little bit uh, freed in that way. So I get enough of an idea, again, 
these are just sketches at this point so that I can start moving forward. At some point, I will have to have, you know, kind of a, a proper strength test of the part and make sure that these connections are working the way that I'm expecting them to. Uh, but for now, I'm just focusing on iterating on the general idea, right? So if I am coring out the surface, if I am making it too aggressive, so mainly some of them are aesthetic comp components, but some others are also performance ones that I can test right away, like the coring out and the, the weight of it, of, of, of the part. I don't know, I, hopefully I, I answered your question. Thanks though. Um, so I'll jump back into CAD, um, kind of moving forward. Oh, sorry, give me one second, there we go. So back into CAD and you see how I showed you guys this horn version. And moving forward, I was just at some point started uh, goofing around. So you see here, and this sort of goes back to that question that, that uh, you guys brought up. I was just playing with the idea, well, what happens if I take the surfaces and, and let me just bring that into kind of focus. If I just take those surfaces and, and put them together, right? So you can imagine, and I don't have the print for, for that actually, it was a, a funny print to have, but I was just wondering, well, if, the, if these surfaces are, are paired together in the front, how would I, that actually feel in the back, right? So if I wanted to get this really paddy version, uh, so I was just goofing around. But again, the idea here is that I might have a question like this one, right? I might I might just be wondering, well, what happens if? So I can, I can print it out overnight and say, eh, you know what? And this is what happened, actually. Uh, it was too flimsy of an object, right? It, it didn't have enough rigidity. It was just going everywhere, all of the surfaces bouncing around. However, I did move forward, and here's where it starts to get interesting. I don't know if you guys, um, hopefully many of you guys signed up to this to know a little bit more about uh, parametric design, right? So here's where I start talking about uh, an additional software that I've been using. It's called Grasshopper. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. But what I was wondering was, well, what happens if I add a pattern to that surface, right? What happens if I... Uh, if I um, create, instead of it being a, a flat, smooth surface, if I can add a pattern so that it gets a little bit more traction on me. Sometimes when you're pushing really hard on the saddle, you can feel yourself slip a little bit. So I was wondering, well, you know, how would that, how would I, I achieve that? So what I did here, um, and, you know, maybe in the future we can talk a little bit more into detail on how Grasshopper works. I'll give you guys just a general idea of, of what I did, but feel free to comment out and, if, and stop me if you have any specific questions. But what I did was I, again, took my very base surface and all that this is doing is I'm actually dividing that surface in a, in a given number of uh, elements. Let me show you guys. So I'll hide some of this for now. Uh, remove that preview. Okay, so and hide that one as well. So what I'm doing right now is I'm taking that surface, and you see these these uh, sliders here. I'm taking a given number of sections, so let's say 15 by 25, and it splits that surface evenly in a number of um, quadrants. You can see the quadrants being represented here. And once I get those quadrants, I look for the center of that. Um, of that geometry, kind of the area. Um, so it's going to give me all of those points. And in each of those points, I'll be projecting, let me hide this again. So I'll be projecting uh, little circles. So let's say I just want to, ha to add these dimples throughout the surface so that I can get that grippiness in, 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 in the object, right? Um, and the other thing, the other interesting thing that's happening here is you can see how the cir circles fade in, um, uh, in the diameter as I reach the outer edges of the object. You can see how right here they are super small and, and in the center they are thicker. The logic behind was behind that was simply saying, well, you know, I think that I will need an even distribution of that uh, uh, creepiness. I just wanted to kind of give me certain very specific areas that I'm going to be tracking onto the saddle. So I took that and then, you know, from those circles, I simply went ahead and, uh, there we go, and extruded them, right? Um, so here are the resulting circles. I pre-baked them for you. It's funny, that command in Grasshopper, it's called bake. So when you kind of, once you're done, you bake them into binary. I don't know. They have nice uh, software and language. But, so these are the baked circles, right? If I... Um, 
if I take those circles, and that's what I did, I, I took those circles and selected, selected a few of them. So I didn't want to have, uh, you know, maybe I, I wasn't looking to have that grippiness. I'll close that up for now. Um, I didn't want to have the grippiness in the in the whole saddle again. I just wanted to focus on, on the rear section so that, again, thinking about that process of pushing into the saddle really hard, uh, how would that work? And so took that idea and I printed it, which was, I, I, the story is starting to get a little bit old. However, again, the interesting part is what happens when I print it? I, my assumption, uh, my, sorry, my assumption right here was you know, with these dimples, I'll be able to create that um, surface tension or, or kind of a, the grippiness from it. The interesting thing was, as soon as I printed it and as soon as I, I got it out of the computer, I realized that the dimples weren't doing anything for me. Can you show it a little closer? Oh, sure. Sorry. So here we go. You can see, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring myself a little closer to you guys. Here we go. There. So you can see the dimples, I instead of extruding it out from the surface, I extruded, I core them, I carved them from that object, right? So I, I just remove the material. And what happens here is I, so I, I'm, I'll, I'll try to run my finger and you see, you know, my finger is, is not getting any disruption when it flows, just like it doesn't here in the, in, in, in the original one. So the original one, it's also like, it's not providing me what I was looking for, but the question isn't, you know, why, why didn't I get the performance out of it? And the answer was, Funny enough, as soon as I as I, I I realized, well, you know what, the thing is, the dimples need to be um, going out instead of going in. It, it was kind of a silly realization, and here here's kind of like the V2. So you can see how on the first one I had them being cored out, and then on the second one over here I have them actually protruding from the surface. So and I'll run my I'll, I'll do the finger thing again. So you can see how. You know, in every one of them, my finger sort of wants to lock into place. Um, and it's funny how that happens sometimes. When you actually think of a feature, you already have the idea of what you want to do. I knew what I wanted to get. Uh, but, you know, as soon as I printed it, I realized that, that I was doing uh, sort of the exact opposite as, of what I should have been doing uh, to begin with. But only by having the, 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 the object in my hand, I was able to realize that, which is why it's really important not to stay so much time uh, inside of the computer, right? Kind of the, I, I heard it called before as being a hands-on design, meaning getting into a physical object as soon as possible, as fast as possible. And there are many ways to doing that. You know, you have uh, foam carving, you have uh, wood carving or 3D printing in this case, which I think it's, it's for me, it's, it's kind of the best way because it keeps me that freedom of, as I said, Designing through the day, printing overnight, and then reacting to the design uh, when I when I come back. So here I have kind of like the result of that, and I wanted to show you guys also how does that you know once you're ready to jump and uh, well actually to print the file, how is that managed and what happens or what are the different implications of uh, doing uh, taking different decisions when printing something. So I'll jump back into the CAD uh, section. Give me one second over here. Here we go. So I have two examples for you. The first of them, and this is kind of what um, the final, one of the final versions of the saddle that I created. So you can see here, I'll maximize it for you guys. There we go. So you can see here, I, I've already evolved that idea, right? So I, I, I realized that I didn't need that many grippy points or, or these dimple points. I also added that uh, carved out section in, in the center. Um, I removed a little bit, I created like a little bit of a hoop here, kind of like th just that uh, chunk that I removed out of the saddle. Um, but what I want to focus on right now is what happens when I'm ready to print. And in this case, how are the supports generated? So, in, you know, if I was to print this object as like that, right, the implications would be, and I'll, I'll have an example because I actually did it uh, once, you know, before we, we came here. So what happens is, the object needs to be supported. So all of those um, overhanging geometry, so all of the items that are not directly connected to the base of the of the print area, will need to be supported by these, um, well, basically supports, we call them supports in MakerBot, uh, that are created by this, this, the slicer tool. The problem with that, and it depends on the system that you're using, right? But the problem with that, regardless of the system that you might be using, is the fact that those supports tend to be sometimes trickier to remove 
Some of them can be soluble, some of them can be solid, like what we used over here. Regardless, it'll take some time for you to remove it. And there's ways and works around, uh, you know, so that you don't get as, ma as many supports as, as uh, you might, depending on the way that you orient the, the, the part. So what I did next, and I'll, I'll jump, I'll come back here in the cat um, element, and I already have it pre-sliced. Um, here we go. So I just reoriented the part, and if I preview my slice, uh, sorry, my slicer, the slicer is, is a tool that enables us, uh, you know, gives us the, the actual commands for the printer to print. Uh, so all that it's doing is actually simulating the movements that the printer is going to make. So I can show you guys, like, if I take up to layer. But what software is this? Oh, this is MakerBot Print. Uh, so it's it's what what I what I've been using here. So I, I mainly use MakerBot printers, um, and it connects directly to the printers. You know, it imports the STL file and directly sends that uh, print to the to the printer itself. So what the software is doing here is actually visualizing, and I can scroll through the whole part and let me bring it a little a little bit closer. Um, it, it's actually going through the part and giving me kind of all of what it, all of the movements and all of the layers that it will be creating as it's printing the part. And you can see how, in this case, be, because of the way that the object is oriented, I don't need any supports, right? Th these orange parts are going to be just my contact points to the surface. So it's just creating, um, you know, very stiff contact points in the surface so that the, the, the print doesn't wobble. Um, and other than that, it's just going to be a clean part. So again, instead of getting, and it's 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 the same, uh, the exact same geometry, right? So instead of getting these kind of eh, difficult to clean part, it's possible to clean it. You know, it's uh, we've been using these, uh, uh, we call them like breakaway supports for a while now. Uh, so it's 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 easy to a degree to clean them up, but it'll take me a while, right? And, and the the whole point is kind of, it's not necessarily to avoid interacting with the printer, but I, I just want the result in order to move forward. So far, I've shown you guys, you know, we went from a flat surface to the to the horns, to the carved out uh, dimple one, into the, you know, offset dimple ones. The idea is to move to the next step. And going back to that question uh, a while ago, I just want to get enough information to be able to jump to the next step. And for for those of you interested in the material science uh, side of things, I think that that's a question that comes in later on in the in the process, right? That's something that we will get to. And as um, you know, the more iterations that we take, the closer we are to that point of actually going, okay, okay, I printed the, the geometry. I understand what I want to do. How do I get it in a material that uh, actually performs the way that I want to. So going back to this um, unsupported version of the saddle, you, you guys can see how it was basically printed like that, um, right? So no support was needed. The surface the, 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 the surface finish is also super nice because that's another thing that happens regardless of the, of the type of supports that you use. It tends to leave a mark uh, in the surface. So it's not, a, it's not a, a, a smooth finish sometimes or most of the time. Um, but yeah, this is kind of my final state um, of the saddle. This was kind of a week-long uh, project, an interesting one. Uh, and you know, for me, uh, what what I what I want to focus on is just this idea of, of the quick iteration process, right? How do I have a notion of what I want to do, and I'm able to print it, react to it? and then get another idea, right? Get, a, get, get, get my brain going in that way so that I can be both sketching in 2D but also sketching in 3D, right? What, also, what we were doing over here, projecting those features into the printed part so that, I, uh, so that I, I get a better understanding of what I'm trying to do. Um, Sorry. But yeah. Uh, cool, we have some questions. Uh -huh. um, what kind of filament are you using? Okay, so I've got two filaments uh, in place. You, it's it's going to be, uh, yeah, I guess you can see it. So this guy, the clear one, it's just a regular PLA. This one, uh, the, the dark gray, is called tough PLA. And the reason why those differ from one another is the, 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 the regular one, you can see it here. So both of them have the same feature, right? If I press on the regular one, uh, let me make it, there we go. If I press on that, oh. It's just, it's just a little bit brittle. <laughs> so 
so you saw how it shattered, like, and you can see where it was before. And but on the on the on the on the top PLA, it's going to be it's going to be have much more of a give, and it's 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 kind of the plasticity, kind of the the, the durometer of it is different. So I can be pushing on it fairly hard, and it'll be still uh, there, right? So uh, sometimes, and, and and this is an, another interesting thing. Like, Sometimes you actually want to, to go ahead and break your parts. So I remember, you know, whenever you use a service bureau and you get back a part that was, uh, you know, five hundred, a thousand dollars to print, you will want to be really careful with that part. And it's it's funny how that can affect you as a designer because now you're not really testing the limits of what it's doing and you know getting a proper understanding of what's happening in it. So being able to break it, I think it's it's really valuable. But again. Uh, if you want something that complies better with with forces, we, we and Maker has this great material. It's, it's some people in in here call it chewy. It's kind of it's difficult to describe, but I, I guess you can see it here. You know, like pressing into it. There we go. So instead, it took me quite some 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 um, strength to break it. And when it broke, it didn't shatter. It sort of you, you can see how it's still connected, right? So it, it just performs differently. Uh, depends on what you're trying to do, but it's it's a great material as well. Uh, um, great. And that kind of brings me to the next question mm -hmm. is, what would you estimate is the cost of these prototypes? And what would you do if you didn't like the design of one of these prototypes after printing it? Oh, I break it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't break it. Uh, so, the co okay, let's start by the cost of the prototypes. And it sort of goes back to that idea of using a service view. And there's, you know, great places out there uh, that you can submit your prints. It depends. Independ it depends on the system that you're using. Um, I can speak for what I did here at MakerBot. So this is about, mm, give or take, $10 worth of material. So let's say each of those iterations were $10 plus, you know, the time that the printer was running, but the electricity, I wouldn't consider uh, that much of an issue. If you were to use a service bureau, I think that you would be looking at at least 10, if not 20 times the cost, depending on the material that you are using, right? If you're using just regular PLA, it's going to be about $150, $200. If you start moving up, uh, that, that price starts to change. And the problem is not only the price tag, but also the time, uh, which is another thing that is really important for me, right? If you consider the time as being another really important asset that you're playing with, if you try to print it with a service bureau, it'll take you at least a week to get it back, right? So if I submit it on Monday, I may get it by uh, by Friday, maybe, but that's too late for me to iterate on it. But by having the printer in house, by having access to a you know a fairly inexpensive machine like a MakerBot, uh, it allows me to print it overnight, not be concerned about the price. And going or moving to the, to that other question of what happens if I don't like. Uh, uh, a prototype, well, I can just break it or toss it. I, I'm not. I'm just half kidding on that, right? Uh, I'm not going to break it. It's it's helping me document the process. So, if if you think about you know me presenting or going out to a client and presenting kind of the kind of the process that you followed, it's going to help you have that conversation. So if I go ahead and say, if I came to you guys and said, and this is a saddle that you should buy, right? There's no real context that support that. Whereas if I had, you know, so I started with a simple surface, I moved ahead and did something a little bit more robust, and then the final result, which, which was a, an, an in-between state with a core out version, the story gets a little bit more beef. So I will want to keep all of those prototypes, all of those versions around, because they are actually not only helping me move forward, but also helping me explain the story to somebody else so that I can really have a firm... Um, I would say solid statement when presenting my idea to somebody else. Cool. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions was, how long do you think one of these prints took, as an example? So the question is, how long the the prints took? Right. Uh, well, it's it it was about eight hours, depending on the it, it ranged between six and eight hours. So if you think about like the simplest uh, shape of here, like kind of like that simple surface. This was about six hours, fairly fast print. Um, this one, because of the, you know, every time that the printer has to move around and create those those little geometries, it was actually printed that way. So that those features start adding up uh, time to the machine. So this is about an eight hour, eight to ten hours print, but it fits nicely with that cycle that I was describing before, right? Going, uh, finishing my day, 
by send by sending a print and then coming the day after and picking it up from the machine, which is like it's so it's like Christmas every morning in a way. But uh, yeah, so that's that's the answer to that. Cool. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things. Some people wanted to know like what kind of settings you used in terms of print settings to yeah. make sure that it came out nice and the way that you have them. Correct. Um, so this is another. It's a question that we do here uh, often. Uh, on the settings, so the, the settings that we, we were using. And I would say that the default from Makeable, I'll run you guys uh, if I can jump back. Let's see. I'll jump back in the so software for a second. But if I, here we go, I can select my settings. Um, we have three main settings here at Makeable Print. Um, the balance, draft, and men fill. Um, Wait, let's go I, I'm here, I'm, I'm there already. Oh, okay. yep. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what I've been using for most of this is just a balanced. The default for that actually means having, let me show you guys the infill. So I can, I can go to the back end of the software and select, you know, very specific properties of the print if I wanted to. Um, for the sake of this, I, I'll show you guys though. So I'll select the ones that I want to show. Show, there we go. Um, normally speaking, I, I, don't spend that much time tinkering with this because of the focus that I have. My focus is to get the part out, right? And, and, and granted, the settings can affect the quality of the part. Most of the time, I would say that it's really easy to get the, to use the default settings on the MakerBot and get a proper result. But for the sake of this conversation, it's like I use 10% infill density. Um, I use the diamond fill that also, um, you know, it's, it's fairly strong. It basically creates a... Uh, diamond grid inside of the of the geometry, kind of what you what you guys were seeing already um, here represented here. So if I if I go back to this cross section view, um, there we go. So here you can see that those crosses, right? So that's a diamond fill. Um, there's multiple of them. The ones that I used were diamond fill, ten percent. Um, what else did I use? I think that was about it. You can go ahead and you know play with the density of it, which will give you a much more robust object. That could probably help out on making sure that these uh, little rods actually withstand a little bit more pressure. Because right now, if I take one out, they're basically almost entirely hollow. Let me jump back um, to the, here we go. Um, so they are mostly hollow, which makes them really brittle. But at the same time, it's it's kind of surprising going back to the material, the tough PLA. It's kind of surprising how much. Oh, there we go. <laughs> how much it'll take for such a. But that's on, on the tough PLA, anyways. Um, so yeah, mainly speaking, you have three options uh, on MakerBot Print: draft, which is going to be really fast. The layer the layer height is going to be higher, which means. The slices are thicker, which you get a coarser print, but it moves faster. Min fill, that minimizes the infill, so it basically create, creates something almost entirely hollow, which is great for printing really fast and when you just want really nice surface quality, but don't care too much about the, the inside of it. Or the balanced one, which gives you that nice, well, balance between um, you know, a completely hollow part and a completely... Uh, draft part, so it prints fast enough, but um, you know, with good quality, I'd say. But yeah. Cool. Um, and then I guess the main question is, uh, did you do any post finish, like post processing or finishing of this piece after you print it? Right. Uh, not at this point. Not yet. Um, I think that, and it goes back to one of the earlier questions, right? On the on these prototypes, I don't necessarily want to be spending a lot of time in any one of them. Uh, I want to actually be able to quickly um, move between one and the other. By the time I'm ready to do a presentation, which you know this wasn't uh, this specific example was not the case for that. Uh, I will probably want to finish it. This ones I didn't, purposely so because as I said, I just wanted to move forward with the geometry and with the with the general uh, process. I think, you know, I, I, and I'm sure that you guys would be interested in learning a little bit more on the pro post-processing side for the next uh, episode. So hopefully we'll, we'll see you guys again. But for the next episode, we'll be talking a little bit more on that. Uh, casting uh, has been a really interesting one. I've been doing some casting in, in uh, silicone and concrete, which actually turns out really cool. I'll, I'll show you guys the next time we, we meet. But um, yeah, so this one didn't, you know, the focus was more on, generating the geometry and running through it uh, fairly fast. 
Um, I think that's about it. Cool. So thank you guys for joining us again. Um, this is really exciting. I'm, I'm really happy to, to to get to interact with you guys. I'm, I'm hoping that you guys enjoyed it as much as, as we did. Um, I'm really happy you know, to hear your questions. Please do leave uh, the comments and do subscribe to our channel if you like this. We will be doing more of this, uh, hopefully in a weekly or bi-weekly manner. Um, hopefully, yeah, Alison is already picking <laughs> out. We'll see, we'll see. But we'll let you guys know. You know, do 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 subscribe to our to our newsletter so that we can let you guys know. We have you know interesting ideas. Going back to that question of uh, the post processing, so doing one around post processing, doing one about uh, lattice structures, so these uh, parametric generated lattices, also uh, kind of other materials that we've been testing uh, here at MakerBot. So this is, this is a shoe prototype that I, I designed. It's just half of it. So, you know, that's another trick that we can talk about later. But it's printed in a flexible filament. So, you know, I can actually uh, flex it. Anyways, so we have a lot of content um, prepared for you guys. If you guys uh, care to join us, I'm really happy that you did today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting you guys again. So uh, thank you and uh, happy printing. <laughs>